All right. Uh, thanks, Drew. And, you know, thanks everyone for coming out tonight, uh, virtually, of course. Uh, yeah, as mentioned, I'm, I'm Alex um, and, you know, Anusha and I, uh, you know, are really excited about kind of uh, giving this talk, talking about cloud agnostic design principles. And, um, you know, this is an adaptation of a talk we had originally given uh, at KubeCon of this year, actually. Um, yeah, so just a little bit kind of more about us, uh, as Drew mentioned, I'm currently the infrastructure lead at Corsha. Uh, I've been working with Kubernetes since 2017 or thereabout. Um, and, you know, working with it really kind of uh, made me aware of the pain of vendor lock-in at, at prior employers, uh, basically. So that's kind of the position at where I joined Corsha from, and that's kind of the position that I, I approached a lot of what we'll talk about tonight from. Awesome. Yeah, I'm Anusha, uh, the co-founder and CTO of Corsha, and uh, honestly, first discovered Kubernetes from Alex when he joined us and kind of converted me. Um, absolutely in love with infrastructure as code. I think it gives, you know, uh, software engineering organizations, just, you know, companies in general, the ability to really elevate infrastructure to kind of a first class citizen in the whole software engineering deployment dev process. Um, and we've embraced Kubernetes and just this, this model of cloud agnostic design um, head on, I think at Corsha. So hopefully we've got some, some lessons and stories to share that'll prove helpful to you all. Absolutely. Yeah. So just to kind of talk about what we'll go over tonight, uh, we'll set the stage for why we even care about any of this. We'll talk about our app briefly um, and, and why we are interested in cloud agnostic design. Uh, we'll talk about some of the fundamental building blocks of our approach towards uh, our cloud agnostic architecture, go over some economics um, of, of cloud computing as we see it today. Uh, we'll talk about terraforming, HashiCorp Terraform, which is really crucial for us. Um, we'll talk about our cloud provider journey as well uh, and go over to scaling these concepts, maybe for larger businesses, right? We are a small business, so we utilize these techniques in different ways in larger corporations, but we'll sort of extend this. Uh, and then we'll end with where we plan to take this design concepts um, and then maybe end with some lessons learned and some stories from, you know, Anusha and I's experience to date. Yeah, so let me start by telling you, just to set the stage, a little bit about what we do. Uh, we are, as Alex mentioned, an early stage startup. So just about eight of us of those five engineers. And the product itself or the platform, essentially we automate um, multi-factor authentication for APIs. So think like your Google Authenticator or your RSA tokens for machines. Um, the way that we do that is we push an authenticator down to a machine or an API client. That authenticator starts developing what we call as a dynamic machine identity against our platform. A core part of our platform is actually a distributed ledger network. So it's a private permissioned blockchain that um, we've actually built off of uh, IBM's Hyperledger fabric. And um, so IBM developed this kind of enterprise private permission blockchain a few years ago, and then they open sourced it with um, the help of the Linux Foundation. And what we've done at Corsha is kind of embrace it, but take it a step further and fully orchestrate it on Kubernetes. And so you'll see why this whole approach to cloud agnostic design and Kates and all of it has been so crucial to, to our platform. Truth is, right, it is a security product, these authenticators are essentially developing these dynamic identities against our ledger network, and then leveraging the identities to produce these fully automated MFA credentials. The MFA credential comes into our proxy that's kind of protecting the API services. It's picked off and checked against the ledger network. If it matches that machine's identity, you let the call through, otherwise you block it. But we basically hook in at the time of deployment and then manage that whole API authentication identity process. So being a security product, we, you know, these are kind of the, the emergent properties we need. We need high availability. We need to, because we are 
dual use in terms of having both commercial and federal customers, government customers, we need to be able to support a SaaS, but also on-prem deployments, right? And we're talking about API traffic. So we need to be able to scale to thousands of real-time requests per second. And so kind of keep those themes in mind as we go through the talk. And, and you know, those are really a lot of the governing principles as to why we developed you know, the, the approach we did to our deployment um, and infrastructure. Yeah, so to kind of add some uh, depth to the actual sort of uh, DLN component of that, um, it, our DLN serves as our persistent tier, right? Distributed ledger. Uh, as Anusha explained, it's Hyperledger Fabric. We're on version 2.2 or something like that. Uh, most of our investment in this product has been in the infrastructure realm in terms of we deploy, we you know, put, built our own Helm charts for it. We automate as much of this as, as we possibly can uh, in, in Kates and everything like that. Um, and so, you know, to, we're not going to go too far into this, but it's just to kind of uh, point, I want to point out that uh, the orderers in this uh, diagram, they're a component of Hyperledger Fabric. And those three orders you see, the order one, two, and three, they form a distributed system uh, amongst each other. And the same thing with the peers at the bottom. And the peers in the orders, you know, uh, form a, uh, a connected kind of graph there. And, uh, you know, they, they sort of work together to federate trust. And it's, it's backed by an X509 certificate, PKI, basically. And, uh, you know, this architecture is what allows this particular blockchain to scale to, you know, potentially tens of thousands of transactions a second, right, which is pretty important when you consider that we really do want security on every single API call. Um, on the left side of this here, you can kind of see we sort of abstract this a bit, the customer components. Uh, the idea is that we push elements of the blockchain to the edge, right, where these little authenticators actually develop sort of small blockchains themselves and they're communicating directly with our blockchain. Uh, and yeah, and then we of course have our proprietary microservices that you know, provide administration and, and sort of business logic there. Um, you know, and again, this, this distributed system here has a lot of nice properties, which uh, as you'll find out, we, we really take advantage of uh, in our cloud journey. Um, and I'll just add one piece to that. So the authenticator itself, you can basically think of it as a, as a container, a sidecar. So if your API client is a container or a pod, you can think of the authenticator as kind of this lightweight sidecar that just couples in. And that's been an important aspect in terms of supporting the scaling, different deployment factors, that type of thing. Yeah, even a lightweight binary for people running it in embed, in embedded context, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And all this, we've been able to run pretty much for free um, for the past couple of years. And how do we do this? Well, we leverage a lot of startup credits that a lot of the major cloud providers uh, are offering. We're what up to almost a quarter million dollars and, and counting actually in discounts and credits. Um, and you know these cloud providers offer these credits because they of course want to entice you in and uh, you know sort of demonstrate the value of your, their services and in exchange for them kind of getting this first class sort of demo, right? You come on and use their infrastructure. They give you some uh, free sort of uh, credit. And you can see sort of here, right? We wound up basically staggering these credit periods, right? So when GCP tapered off, we would begin, for example, a trial with AWS, um, evaluate their offering and then migrate to Azure. Uh, and yeah, as, as soon as one sort of dried up, we'd be migrating to the next one. Yeah, um, and I guess, so how many of you out there have either worked for a startup, been involved with a startup over time? If I see, see Drew, I see some, some hands. Um, so all of you, you're probably very familiar with the cardinal rule, right? Drew, don't run out of money. And so certainly this whole concept of, of uh, leveraging the credits has been awesome for operating costs early on and to allow us to kind of learn and play and as Alex said really explore the different cloud platforms um, but it's also been great for helping us mature our product because oftentimes these startup programs come with 
a ton of support um, behind the scenes. So for example, you know, we're transitioning over to Google right now and they've been extremely helpful even in terms of helping us terraform and giving us a sense of where we can optimize um, our deployments and kind of the shape of our DLN and, and you know, cluster and so forth. So it's a really a great way to um, both keep operating costs low and explore. And it is, you know, it's a, it's a ton of credit that's let us like do things like performance benchmarking and stuff, but also just learn the environments. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a win-win. We maintain a presence on a lot of these cloud providers still, right? To what degree? Well, that varies, but as we, as we grow, right? Like that's a future line of business and we already are kind of onboarded with them. So, you know, I would say the linchpin for all of this, of course, is Kubernetes, right? We didn't exactly start out on this journey of, oh, we want to be able to switch from different cloud providers and, and this and that. Uh, our needs were driven primarily by the nature of our product, right? As Anusha had mentioned earlier, uh, we are a cybersecurity product. So our customers have varying levels of, of kind of security and, and trust they're willing to place. So, for example, we have some customers that want to run completely on prem right? Uh, and for example, they might use COPS to form a Kubernetes cluster, right? Um, some, some of our customers uh, are using VMware products and they are comfortable with VMs. So we can quickly install K3S, which is a you know, lightweight single node Kubernetes cluster, quickly put that on a VM. We can install our same uh, charts, Helm charts and, Kuber and containers on that. And, you know, they are just quickly out of the gate um, trying out our, our product. Uh, other customers, for example, are completely fine on public clouds, right? Uh, and we meet them where they are on their cloud provider uh, and they can get massive scale, right? And so we ourselves are right now developing on Azure. And so of course, as I'm sure many of us are familiar, you know, you develop the same container, the container runs equally well. And the same thing with the Helm charts, we distribute that through, of course, our online artifactory repo. And so uh, the customers can, you know, sort of run it how they want, right? We say, okay, you know, it doesn't matter what sort of setup you need to perform, just get us a Kubernetes cluster and you can get with, of course, the right resources, the same scale. Right, and so like Alex mentioned, we didn't really, we kind of, um, I wouldn't say stumbled, but evolved into this this property of the cloud agnosticism, essentially. We, um, a lot of our requirements were around, we wanted to make sure that we had a, a high fault tolerance system, a distributed notion of trust and consensus. So that's where we kind of gravitated towards a blockchain and the distributed ledger technology. We knew that we wanted to be a kind of dual sector. So both commercial and government. So we wanted to be able to run across a wide range of providers at scale and kind of meet customers where they were. So we chose to go with this with Kubernetes as that indirection layer that allows us to be agnostic to the platform underneath. Um, as Alex mentioned, we have to have the ability to run in a fully air gap network. Um, and so omitting that constraint of a particular cloud provider, a particular SaaS as a design constraint was really important. And then being able to spin up quickly um, also super important. So, you know, yes, we have a blockchain as part of the platform, but it's small purpose built and we can run in a, in a pretty um, trim tight environment. But, and, you know, what happens is we, we really don't envision having kind of one distributed ledger to rule them all really. It's more of kind of a forest type of implementation. So we can stand up these production grade services wherever our customers are very quickly. Uh, and that's really, you know, the way we've achieved that is through the rich ecosystem of Helm charts and leveraging a lot of these dependencies that are um, pretty production grade services that are already published in various artifact hubs and, and stable repos and stuff. So really this nice, rich ecosystem of, uh, of um, open source and just community development. Yeah, and that's really, you know, one of the biggest benefits of the cloud, isn't it? That you don't really need to know how to stand up a Postgres server or install the Postgres binary or anything like that, right? The cloud provider sort of manages that for you and presents a uniform API that your application, usually through a client, of course, uh, communicates with. 
Um, so our challenge was, well, how do we provide this for a customer that you know, never wants to be on a public cloud, right? How can we support that and, and run just fine? Well, the answer is you sort of DIY, right? Uh, and yeah, as Anusha mentioned, you know, we can get pretty darn close to what's available through, through a managed service from, you know, some of these large cloud providers. Uh, so here we have a small case study of example, managed Postgres, right? Uh, I just went on to uh, AWS's RDS site and just pulled off kind of their high level bullet points of, of why you would want to use it and sort of have matched it here to the Bitnami Postgres HA chart, for example. Um, so for, you know, pick out a few, uh, RDS offers easy managed deployments. Well, you know, Helm install, right? You add the Helm repo that has this chart, run Helm install and boom, right? You, the Helm chart unpacks and it installs all your containers. Um, you know, fast storage, well, with, the, and again, these are all switches that you can flick on this chart. You set the global storage class variable on your own Helm chart, and you're using the, the same exact even type of storage that's backing it. Um, stuff like backup and recovery, you know, there are tons of, of backup products like Valero, um, it, which we is on our roadmap. But, you know, again, this is sort of bringing these off the shelf solutions uh, and combining them. Uh, RDS offers high availability, read replica as well. That's again, a switch, right? That you can just sort of flick on this Helm chart and, and tune. Um, you know, it has uh, Prometheus metrics. Uh, of course it supports TLS and everything. The, you know, the, the costs are of course, there is no SLA, right? AWS gives you a financially backed SLA that it's up. Uh, we are our SLA for this, right? And, you know, I'd, I'd have to say uh, that we've had this in production for a while and we've rarely had any sort of issues or maybe none at all, right? So like these charts are, are quite stable. So we feel pretty confident, uh, you know, sort of offering this to our customers at a production level. You know, another sort of cost is the config, of course, right? Um, all this needs to be configured. We found though, since all of our configuration is uh, in code, this is a one-time cost that you sort of pay up front on that first installation. And then it's committed to Git or wherever, and then uh, jammed into the Helm chart at install time. Uh, so another problem we faced was sort of level setting all of these cloud provider customers. Uh, there are some things that Kubernetes simply can't abstract away, right? Case in point, storage providers. That's a attribute of the cloud provider. Uh, load balancers are another example, right? There are small uh, nuances between different load balancers provided by different providers. Uh, and so our approach to this was what we uh, call the Corsha bootstrap chart, right? Uh, we concentrate all the cloud provider specific configuration into this one chart. Uh, so when we want to onboard a new provider, it's like, okay, what's our distance? We look at one place here. And I copied a little snippet of the uh, you know, Helm template from here. And we basically pass in the cloud provider as a value into this Helm chart, right? So it renders differently based on where we're installing it. So when it's AWS, it'll supply the AWS provisioner versus G, you know, GKE, we use GKE's provisioner. Um, and then that'll become our storage class that's underpinning all this, right? And so uh, I also have an example of kind of the different things we'll have in a, our bootstrap chart. Um, storage classes, like we see here, ingress settings. Um, most of ours here are again around the small difference between load balancers, some uh, support proxy protocols, some don't. Um, WAF config. So this is our web application firewall that runs behind our um, ingress. So we have one load balancer that basically is, you know, serving the whole cluster. And again, our WAF config is provider dependent because of differences in, um, you know, translating IP addresses, for example, proxy protocol headers. Uh, and in the future, we'd love to have CRDs, custom resources that just sort of get installed right at the cluster, right after it's been created. And these are available for all developers or users or what have you. So, everything pretty much without exception in our cluster is in a Helm chart, uh, no matter how small it is. And so this quickly, you know, sort of we have this problem of uh, how do we manage what becomes dozens and dozens of Helm charts? 
uh, we can't just be going Helm install from the command line all day, right? That's just, that's not scalable. Uh, and we found our answer actually in this awesome piece of software called Helm file. Uh, and it's, it's on GitHub open source and all that. What it is, is it's essentially a list of different releases, right? And it just sort of, I have an example here, Helm file just goes down this YAML list and at one after the other installs those charts. Um, you can point to values files that have the config for that particular chart. Uh, it supports encrypted secrets, for example. Uh, and so, you know, in this example, we have a, a Helm file that implements our elk step, right? And our actual one that we use really isn't much more complicated than this. Um, and it just sort of runs it installs the proper versions. And uh, all of this, of course, is in Git. So it's reproducible by either us or uh, an automated sort of uh, CD system. Uh, and in general, we go with one Helm file per service. Uh, so we have one that installs our core services like our ingress controllers. Another one that obviously only gets run in dev that installs CI CD and uh, Sonar Cube and all that other stuff. And then one that installs sort of a, a customer stack, so to speak. Right. So, you know, kind of pulling these these pieces together, um, you know, at both the clus cluster level, but then a customer level, what we end up getting is this emergent property of cloud agnosticism, right? So we can deploy on prem at scale with the same infrastructure that we do for public clouds. And oftentimes it's just a, you know, we, we can vary the scale of a particular deployment just by modifying values files and resources and limits and things like that. And go from zero to a fully operational cluster, whether it's in dev, staging or prod in a matter of minutes. So really we can throw up one of our, um, you know, customer, uh, deployments, including the distributed ledger, I think in about what, 10 to 15 minutes, Alex? Yep, something about that. Yeah. Um, and that's on all of the major cloud providers. Um, and really, they all offer managed CATES, right? Um, which makes it super easy to kind of stand up a cluster and you don't necessarily have to run master nodes yourself and all of that. Um, and then the trick for us is making sure, you know, like we went over that Postgres chart, is making sure that we're not bringing in, we're not requiring anything in terms of managed services necessarily unintentionally, that, that uh, we're not bringing anything with us into a new, we're not um, starting a cluster that way we wouldn't bring anything, we wouldn't bring with us into a new cluster. We can kind of start from scratch just using Helm and Helm file. Yeah, absolutely. Like all those managed services, case in point. Yep. So, yeah, we, we sort of, you know, had this moment of, oh, wow, you know, we are cloud agnostic just due to the requirements of, of the product. So our first avenue, of course, was the straight economic route, essentially, right? And we, we sort of realized that, you know, cloud computing these days is increasingly becoming a commodity, right? One vCPU on AWS is by and large the same as one vCPU on Google Cloud Platform, for example. So, you know, all these cloud providers are battling over market share. Um, some are profitable and wanting to defend it, right? Others are willing to take losses to gain market share. Uh, and, and this is pretty fierce competition. This, of course, creates opportunities for us, the customers and the users. Uh, so I just made up a little graphic here. I just went online in, in August of this year and, and grab some prices online to just kind of illustrate the differences and the opportunities that exist for uh, you know, organizations willing to migrate uh, from different cloud providers, right? So if you're going from GCP to DigitalOcean, for example, that could be a 9% savings on an on-demand instance rate for the, about the same size. Uh, you know, migrating from Azure to AWS, 15%. Uh, savings for the same uh, instance size in the same region, uh, you know, and there you can go in the other direction and, and kind of uh, pay more. Uh, but the point is, we kind of looked at this matrix and thought, you know, there, there could be some real opportunities here. Right. And so, you know, this is great. We can save money if we switch cloud providers, but um, there is still that distance of you have to get the cloud provider configured to the point of being able to actually receive the Kate's API commands. And that is pretty 
provider specific. There's still no push button, Kate's plus work or no deployment. Um, the use cases are kind of diverse. The workloads are diverse. And uh, that's where um, really, you know, the, uh, and Alex will speak to this. This is where kind of Terraform helps. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, you know, we need to configure either managed Kubernetes or, or something else, back it with worker nodes, right? Uh, and so what we did was uh, basically utilize Terraform. And truly, you know, this did rescue us. We could go from nothing to having uh, at least a dev cluster running on a new cloud provider in really less than two weeks of, of a single person's time, essentially. Uh, so, you know, here is an example of sort of how we organize our Terraform directory. You can see we have a module for AWS uh, in the center graphic, a module for Azure. Uh, you know, all the cloud providers have excellent Terraform code, right? They want, again, this to incentivize you to come over to their platform. So there's lots of example code to use. Uh, so we sort of flip the concept of the bootstrap chart in that we say, okay, every Terraform module is going to be written by that provider and is going to be not interchangeable with the other providers. So instead we concentrate all the config at this level that is common to all the cloud providers. So you could see an example of this here, right? Like our max uh, node pool size, for example, it, it's gonna be the same logically, whether it's running on Google or, or AWS or Azure. So that's a common variable. The same thing with our whitelists, for example, right? Like our, our whitelists for our developers are going to be the same uh, across all cloud platforms. And so this common module is imported into this AWS module, this Azure module, and uh, is basically used to sort of inject config depending on which stage uh, we're deploying in. And, uh, you know, we do make heavy use of Terraform workspaces. We sort of use that and, and Terraform passes whether you're in dev or prod or staging into the module as a variable. So that's how we index into this list. And you know, uh, Terraform coalesces all these variables together. Some are provider specific, some are from this common module and uh, basically you know, does, does all of our setup and we just sort of sit back and, and watch that happen. Uh, so before we go on any further, I just kind of wanted to give a nod to this idea of migrating prod and, and disaster recovery, right? Uh, in our case, which I think is, is what we can best speak to, our application architecture sort of bails us out here, right? In that we have a distributed system that is designed to have nodes dynamically come up and, and go down in it. Uh, so we do what we call straddling, which is where we uh, will add a new node onto the new cloud provider, connect it into the existing network that's on the old cloud provider. So in this case, at the bottom, we have a sample migration from Azure to GKE. Uh, let it get synced up, right? Once the uh, distributed system is back uh, to full, full fu uh, function, then we add in the next node, uh, node one, for example, and slowly migrate it over that way. Uh, and that's not just because we use a blockchain. Other examples like PG Pool has a lot of these sort of attach and detach nodes. You can migrate over your uh, Postgres database. Uh, again, this, this design requires a little bit of upfront sort of decisions about this, right, to use these tools. Uh, speaking about disaster recovery, well, there are a lot of uh, commercial solutions like Valero and even Kubernetes increasingly is having built-in objects like volume snapshotting, right? And then our advice would just be to sort of develop automation around the creation and use of these uh, again, staying as pure Kubernetes as possible so you're not locked into any one cloud provider's image backup uh, solution or what have you. So to kind of put it all together, here, uh, here's our sort of overall stack, right? Um, and it's all in, in pursuit of kind of this, the, the customer namespace, that's what actually is delivering value to our customers. Uh, it's a Golang, binary, uh, some node stuff on the front end, and of course, Postgres for customer data. Um, in this example, this is a, a dev stack. So we have a CI CD namespace. Uh, we install our own Jenkins, our own Sonar Cube. Uh, we have a Kubernetes Elk namespace, which again, we have, uh, we put a full Elk stack in, and then we have in here a last alert, which is sort of log based alerting. Uh, we install Prometheus and Grafana here in the monitoring namespace so that we have our sort of 
open source internal cloud agnostic monitoring solution and alerting and analysis. Um, and then finally, the ingress namespace. Uh, so we use Cert Manager here to handle all of our SSL certs. Um, you know, sort of the one thing we, we do here is, and we'll, we'll talk about this later, uh, some services we don't bother migrating, uh, like DNS wasn't enough of a, a price pain point. So we have a tool called external DNS, which no matter where this cluster is running, it's just using an AWS service account to create records in Route 53. Um, all of this running, of course, on Kubernetes, which in turn was created on Terraform. Yeah, so essentially you pull all the pieces together and what we have is this kind of application platform in a box that we can just kind of move around at will. Um, whether we're running that on, you know, ES ESXi infrastructure, whether we're running it on Azure or, you know, AWS Gov, like it's really the same stack. Yeah, so, you know, we thought we would go over our journey a little bit um, just to tell you how we matured in terms of our um, pipelines and, and development processes, workflows. So we started the company in early 2018, I guess. And then, uh, you know, Alex joined us um, halfway through the year. And like I said, he's the one that kind of brought us Kate's and Helm and all of that. We developed um, similar to like Cube Cuddle, kind of a Corsha Cuddle that allows us to build out our customer stacks, our, you know, like basically everything you saw in that those different namespaces. And then we introduced Helm file. Um, we knew that we were gonna migrate over from GCP into AWS. So we started investing in terraforming. So it would make that migration easier towards kind of the end of 2019. And then that's when we shifted over to AWS, we started maturing a little bit and then we introduced Elk, right? Um, and I think at that point we were using um, Travis in the cloud for CICD and we wanted to kind of bring it in house and um, I'll pass it over to you there, Alex. Yeah, yeah, I, I would say that, you know, this Terraform moment in Q3 of 2019 was really our light bulb moment, right? And that it's like, wow, it is really not uh, terribly difficult to quickly onboard a new cloud provider, right? And at that point, we can use the exact same Kubernetes objects that we've been using. So you could sort of see this uh, shift to us implementing our own version of managed services, right? Elk, CICD, uh, monitoring in the form of Prometheus a year later. Uh, yeah, and then we switched from AWS to Azure, again, terraforming Azure. Um, and then we used Azure, what, for the, for the last year, pretty much. Um, after that, you know, we, we realized that, okay, we're, we're all in on Helm charts and, and containers. So we began a, you know, security, uh, program where we're now scanning our containers with Trivi um, and we sign every one of our Helm charts and, and validate that against our chart signing key since we are so dependent on those. Um, so yeah, currently we are still on Azure, but we are, you know, potentially right days away from migrating over to GCP, who, as Anusha mentioned, we've been working with and, and they've kind of, you know, rolled out the, the welcome wagon for us. So that's probably the next step in our journey here. Um, again, though, some, some of our customers like to remain on Azure, so we, we will maintain a, a cloud presence. This mostly reflects the, full, the majority of our compute, such as our dev and staging infrastructure and our SaaS offering. Right, yeah. And so, you know, we'd like to think that these concepts of um, uh, staying true to a cloud agnostic design is not just for startups, right? As Alex showed you with some of the, the economics around it, you can save quite a bit by having the flexibility to, to switch environments, switch providers, and that really just turns into negotiating power. And that's why, you know, now we're working with GCP and uh, they, you know, they've been both very uh, helpful in terms of kind of negotiating costs and all that, but also just in terms of helping us with the Terraform, the support and all of that. So, you know, it's, um, it's really, 
it's really proven to be not just cost effective, but but super flexible, able to meet our customers where they are um, in in staying true to this model of not not buying in or making any one particular spot home. Yeah, absolutely. Um, more recently, you know, we we've started to ask ourselves, well, what else can we do with cloud agnostic design? Right, we have this system that is cloud agnostic originally driven by customer requirements in the, in the medium term, driven by economic uh, incentives. Looking ahead, we really like this idea of uh, what we call a zero trust deployment, right? Where we are not relying on the availability or uh, even the compromise of one cloud provider, right? To, to underpin our system, right? So we had looked at sort of a migration where some services are running on one cloud provider, some are running on the other. Well, what if we never quote finish the migration, right? And at an application level, different blockchain nodes are talking to each other, one talking on Azure, talking to one on AWS, and both of those talking to Google Cloud and together forming a distributed system, right? The clients don't really care. It's just a DNS name, right? And they re they reach out to all three. And you know, we build uh, we have fault tolerance built in so that if one goes down, you know, it communicates with the other two. Um, and so this sort of furthers our business goals, right, of, again, driving up the attack costs of the service so high, right, as to make it infeasible. Um, and, you know, the nice thing about a blockchain is it is Byzantine fault tolerant, right? So you can have a, a knowledgeable adversary compromise one of these cloud providers and even side channel you, right, and it, the security of the system wouldn't be impacted. So, you know, we'll kind of summarize here and then conclude with uh, our lessons learned. You know, Anusha and I sat down and, and talked about the journey over the last, what, three years now. Um, and so I think, you know, a big one for me was choosing persistence that has good distributed systems properties. Uh, this was a really great decision that uh, was made before I arrived, but has really helped us in that it eases migration, right, between cloud providers, because we can do that sort of straddling concept we talked about. Um, it, it, it allows us again to uh, tolerate failures, right? And, and makes a lot of this cloud hopping a lot less stressful because you can sort of rely on the application itself to, to keep you uh, up to date. Um, we'd also recommend migrating your dev cluster to the new cloud provider first um, to make your engineering staff put up with any uh, unforeseen sort of issues or hiccups rather than the customers. Uh, and then iron those kinks out and then staging comes over and prod and turn. Right. And as Alex mentioned, you know, there may be low cost services that aren't worth it. So it's not like a blanket strategy, but take a look for us, things like DNS, it didn't make sense. And so we've kind of stuck with route 53. Um, and then there are, as I'm sure, you know, everyone in this group is, is, super versed in this. There's just a ton of free open source um, projects out there that oftentimes are doing exactly what you need them to do. So, you know, I think all we, our model has always been start with trade studies, do the, the research. Um, and, you know, that's the, it can save you a, a ton of time and, and move you kind of just accelerate features, progress, support the whole bit. Yeah, it's definitely paid major dividends beyond time invested in the research phase. Uh, as we mentioned, concentrating all our cloud provider specific configuration into a bootstrap Helm chart uh, definitely helps, right? It, it has less mistakes because again, you just go to that one chart and if you've gotten everything sort of tweaked for your new cloud provider, you can be reasonably sure you're not going to get caught up um, with Kubernetes objects anyway. Um, and, you know, just in general, pulling as much off the shelf as we possibly can, particularly Terraform and particularly within that Terraform IAM stuff, uh, just using as much of that, you know, is again, sort of standing on the shoulders of giants uh, and lets us sort of quickly end on a shoestring uh, budget sort of uh, hop to a new cloud provider and again, make these credit incentives really worth it. Yeah, and for the last lesson, I will I'll tell a little story. So we were going through a bunch of a phase where I was really obsessed with improving performance. 
of the overall platform. And so everything was about, all right, how do we get our, our transactions per second higher? How do we, you know, keep the latency low? And, and so, my, and you'll see this on, if you ever break into our Slack, there was this whole period of like, hashtag no limits, no limits, no limits, just turn everything off and see how fast we can go. And uh, every time I would put that up there, we would see Alex with an eye roll because request limits really do help the scheduler. And so you do have to be kind of reasonable there and, uh, you know, kind of stepwise, um, you know, if you're doing performance benchmarking, no limits doesn't help for what it's worth. Yeah. Yeah. Kubernetes is pretty good at inferring those if you don't give it any, but there's nothing like that programmer knowledge, right, of what to expect. And that's all we had tonight. Uh, you know, thanks everybody again for coming out and, you know, hope you found this interesting. Definitely interested to, to chat more if there's anything, uh, you know, that you want to know more about. Are you taking questions now? Yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. Okay. Because now multiple solutions out there for containerization, serverless ideas, and Quarkus, Microsoft inside of the stuff. Do you have solutions for those with you know Google's and AWS and all this stuff? Could you save money that way also? Hmm. I guess I would say for serverless, for example. So for our serverless stuff, we do use AWS uh, Lambda. Um, that's not something we migrated. Again, that's one of those low cost services. Uh, yes, uh, yes, yeah. ECS. Oh, ECS. Um, yeah, I, I would say that we have kind of gone all in on Kubernetes. Uh, so we use EKS when we use it, Amazon. Okay. But, you know, the same concept of these credits, it really doesn't matter what the resources are you're leveraging in order to, to leverage these credits. So you can absolutely apply them to ECS. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that same um approach applies whether you're using you know elastic container service or whether you're going the the kubernetes route okay thank you thank you i have a question um how did you decide where to draw the agnostic line right so you brought up the example of postgres um you know, from an application perspective, right? Uh, the Postgres interface is the Postgres interface. So if you have RDS or Postgres running Kubernetes, um, you know, a database client doesn't care. Yeah. Um, especially when you're using infrastructure as code, right? In order to spin up things in a, a certain cloud, um, what other factors really drove you in the direction of like, hey, we want to run all the things in Kubernetes? Um. So it was actually, and I'll take a stab and then Alex, you should definitely chime in as well. Sure. You know, a lot of our, our early traction has been on the Air Force side. And it was um, there, we're oftentimes even working in like legacy architectures or a lot of it is still data center or ES, ESXi type deployments. And so there it was really helpful to have a fully self-contained uh, customer stack that we could put in there. And so not having to rely on a, a managed Postgres, at least off the bat was helpful. Um, you know, we did, I think our first deployment was actually, we were putting K3S on, uh, on, um, a collection of VMs, right. To prove out a pilot, but now we are actually looking at uh, also supporting kind of a managed Postgres route on cloud providers. And that is, you know, to, to have better scales, to kind of leverage some of the, the benefits of RDS. So, you know, we, we made that choice early on, but um, I think we're, we're trying to support both right now. Would you say that's fair, Alex? Yeah, absolutely. And we, we always knew that that door was kind of open to us, right? We, we, we never said no managed Postgres forever because you know, part of the power of Kubernetes is you can swap out what's behind that service, right? So your service running in Kubernetes is accessing a Postgres at Postgres colon, what is it, 5375 or whatever Postgres support is. Well, that can be swapped out to point from your uh, your locally deployed 
uh, one to a managed service. And that's actually yet what we're utilizing now. Uh, so that, that's kind of that, that layer of indirection. So that's kind of why we settled on installing it in Kubernetes. It's like, well, you know, we can always go back easily enough. Well, thank you. Looking over in the chat, nothing coming up in there yet. No question. How much? Uh, how much time do you feel like? And I'm, I apologize if you said this. I had to go put my kids to bed <laughs> in the middle of your talk. I'm sorry. Okay. But uh, how much time do you feel like you 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 use yourself? Um, um, you know, at your company when you actually do go ahead and move providers. Yeah, um, so it takes uh, about what it takes one person, uh, probably a sprint and a half an issue. What do you think? So that's our sprints are two weeks. So uh, yeah, what one person, maybe two or three weeks of their time. Um, and that's from nothing uh, to, you know, got every all the developers spinning up their stacks on the new provider. But I would say that's to a fresh provider where we may not have right. Terraform set up. Like now um, for us to go back to say GCP is going to be much faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, to the point of where we maintain a light presence on all of these still. Um, yeah. Like we, until very recently, we're running a small Kubernetes cluster in AWS. Because again, the beauty of infrastructure as code is once it's written, it's written, right? And it's very easy for us to maintain. Yeah. So yeah, to stand up a cluster, like, you know, I think we, we also have a presence on like Azure Gov and mm -hmm. to stand up a cluster there, I don't know, less than a day, Alex? Uh, About yeah. a day? A half a day with yeah. the Terraform written. Um, you know, you're just sort of plugging in things and upgrading a Kubernetes version here and there. And again, that's one of the cool things that the Terraform is we, we uh, the Kubernetes version is one of those things we push out into a common module, right? Um, and so you, you take the time to upgrade it, test out and, and get up and running. Again, IAM is usually one of the bigger ones to set up. So I know you guys, you said you like, um, you leverage credits and stuff when you move. Have you ever gone to a provider and said like, hey, we're going to move what can you do for us to keep us on your platform? Yeah, actually we did that um, with Azure and uh, you know, we kind of knew that we would be maintaining some presence on Azure anyway. And so what they have done is they've, um, like I said, we do, you know, some government customers and stuff. So what they have done is connected us with like their fast track landing zone to make it easier and give us the support to get on their marketplace, for example, and get us through what's called like an ATO process as fast as possible. So that's authority to operate on um, some of these, these uh, government networks like Azure government cloud and things like that. So absolutely, we, we do that kind of every time. Um, and especially now that we've kind of exhausted all of these startup credits on the major providers, we're definitely leaning into that. But we do have relationships now with all of these startup programs and with the uh, um, folks on each provider that we continue to, to keep. Yeah, case in point is Google, right? We had done their startup program, uh, left it, right, after the credit was gone, and then they successfully lured us back with, you know, engineering support credits from partners and, and discounts and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Cool. And do you guys, do you feel like you're missing out on any like, um, you know, cost savings with like, um, you know, upfront pricing and, and those type of things? Um, so we can still leverage the upfront pricing and reservations and stuff like that. And we are in fact on Azure. So you still kind of make use of a lot of that and, uh, um, what does Google call it? Something, uh, committed use discount, committed use discounts, like all of that is, is still in play. Um, and with Azure, you know, we've kind of now estimated 
the reservations that make sense for us so we can get to about 100% utilization. So there's still all of that kind of cost um, uh, optimization you can do on top of these strategies too. Yeah, I would say the way it's manifesting is we maybe don't commit for as long, right? Yeah. So we don't get as deep of a discount as you know these many year commitments, for example. Um, but that that's worth it for us. So I have a question about security. Um, you mentioned, I think, in one of your lessons learned that um, using free and open, you know, free open source software, leveraging that as much as you can. Um, how much do you do in the way of evaluating those open source projects and their software for security? Because the more of that that you bring in, well, you've got licensing concerns, but then on the security side, you've you've just got a whole host of things you have to do to um, in your dependencies, you know, to keep an eye on security from of all of that products. If, if you're trying to build a security product, yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's you know, with the the free open source software, we kind of have a pretty rigorous trade study process that does look into the supply chain and a lot of the, um, uh you know, the, the adoption, the integration, all of that as we're selecting what libraries and tools to bring in. But then also we try to build into our AppSec a number of different security scanners and kind of a layered approach to that where even their dependencies, we're making sure that we are, uh, you know, right into our nightly pipelines catching if they're triggering against any of these security standards like Synopsys, SonarCube, Trivi. Um, we, sure. we kind of take a very layered approach to all of that. Um, but you're absolutely right. I mean, there is, there is a, a, a balance there in terms of being very intentional about what you bring into your, your pipeline and your artifacts. And then I'll also add on to that, that, you know, in terms of our platform itself, we certainly try to uh, um, drink our own champagne, if you will. So all of our communication that's happening into and out of our platform is MFA, even over API. So it's all mutual TLS. It's all um, using us as well on top of it. And so we we try to keep a pretty tight ship from both an AppSec and a, a deployment perspective. Yeah, and just to add on to that, um, what we do is as soon as we uh, either onboard a chart and it goes through its scanning and onboarding process, or when we want to make an upgrade, it comes into our repositories, right? We aren't relying on pulling from public repositories or anything like that. Um, we pull it in. In some cases, we rebuild it and sign it with our key just to kind of guard that aspect of the supply chain. So are you doing SBOMs as well? Uh, sorry, not... Uh, Bill of materials, idea of containers, SBOM. Uh, no, we are not currently using that, actually. I'm surprised because you're in the government space and now the government is now requiring it. And I think it's a good thought to use yeah. it. You sign your containers. Yeah. showing the inventory inside of your containers yeah. not just a scan but showing what's inside of it so you can compare it outside and show the validity of what's being delivered yeah yeah you're absolutely right and this is um you know this is something that we're we're starting to look at as well you know bringing into our pipeline is doing the s-bombs we've just kind of gotten through the container scanning and the signing and you know hosting our own charts and all of that so it's definitely something that we are we are near term doing so for the vulnerabilities that you're experiencing over time because you've shown multiple years okay therefore you must have aged containers out there how often do you rebuild do you have a policy on this yeah, so um, what we do, even in terms of our base images, is we are based off of um, 
platform one's base images. So we use um, the Air Force has a, a container registry essentially um, hosted through platform one. I think it's like Harbor or something. And so we are periodically updating our base images to refresh containers and refresh that. And then we build off of that nightly and run scans and everything nightly so that if anything does trigger off of a particular dependency, then that's what triggers us to, to upgrade that dependency. So you're deploying nightly for those issues and solving them? Yeah. In an automated fashion? In an automated fashion, yeah. Okay, that helps. So do you have a CV database that you're going against so that you know how much data is being updated against that database to ensure that you're getting all the vulnerabilities? Because this is the difference between open source and commercial products. And the commercial products are private CVs. And this is where, unfortunately, when I was working for IBM and all this stuff, that's the gold. Yeah, so, you know, um, it's interesting. Like we're trying to follow this software factory kind of platform one approach. And so we're using the process that they have for uh, building out these hardened images. And so basing off of that, we get a little bit of that. Um, but you're right, we do need to have kind of that, that closed registry. And we do have a closed kind of artifact repository where we're storing all of our containers, binaries, charts, the whole bit. And, you know, yeah, you're right. It is the difference between the free open source and commercial is that level of, of control into that release and deployment process. Um, the guidance that we're getting on the Air Force side is is start with that container registry. I'm not trying to object to what you're getting from the Air Force. It's the fact that the common vulnerabilities that I think the enterprise systems have that are not being shared with the public. Okay, it's about money, I understand it. But unfortunately, this is where you have to pay. And I think it is in your best interest to not pollute your repositories and use the best and get them, I don't care, it may be noise to you, but get the most noise out of the system that you can. Yeah. Yeah, no, agreed, agreed. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a, you know, it's a, what we're trying to do is kind of evolve with this story that, that the Air Force is putting out in terms of what they call as continuous ATO. Um, and so it's that balance of making sure, and this is where we're jumping into this feedback loop now where we're trying to get our own containers published into their registries. And I think that will give us a little bit more control in terms of cutting out some of this noise. So I think that's, that's kind of how we kind of close some of that loop, if that makes sense. And it's kind of like, I mean, that's what an iterative process is, right? You've got, I mean, there's the ultimate goal that you strive for, and there's just the milestones that you hit as you go along. Any, um, any other thoughts or questions or uh, we've been at this for a little over an hour now. It's, um, yeah. Any other questions for the, uh, for the speakers? Another slow count to five. Okay, we'll go ahead and we'll cut the recording. Uh, thank you so much, Alex. Thank you, Anusha. This has been really great. Yeah, it's thank been great you. for us. Thank you. This is awesome. Thank you for the discussion. And thank you for taking my questions, really. It's very helpful to get other thoughts from people when we have these talks. Yeah, absolutely.